here is a um, Hello, welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram and this is August 29th, 2018, episode two, 202. You can see all of my episodes at uh, my website, walkinthepark.tv, walkinthepark.tv. That's a URL, that's a, a link. Uh, go to that. And this is a public access television show series, weekly series in Ithaca, New York, Pegasus is at the Pegasus Studios. Pegasus stands for Public Educational Government Access System. So we have uh, three different channels. This is channel 13 with showing uh, channel 13, 15, and 16. And we show the Public Educational and Government Access Programming. And you can see the whole schedule on our website at pegasus.webstarts.com. And you can also see the uh, uh, training schedule to become a producer yourself. And uh, you can see some folks there that are in studios and carrying cameras and things like that. You can take a class and learn to use all that stuff, get permission to use it, and uh, do uh, pro uh, studio programs and also programs out in the field when you get take equipment, borrow equipment, sign it out, which you're responsible for, and um, take your own shows. And you'll see some of the, uh, you'll see a clip in this uh, show that I've taken in the field. So, okay, we're going to go to... Tagani Falls State Park to start with here. This was a picture taken on August 15th, the day after the big flood that was in the central Finger Lakes here. But I'm going to show you another picture. This is uh, taken back in the 1800s, sometime in the late 1800s. And that was uh, early days of photography. And you can see that there's not a lot of water on the falls there, but you can see an artist down in the lower right. Now this picture, the next picture, and also all the aerial photographs except for the Google shots that I have in this show, uh, are courtesy of Bill Hecht, who likes to scan a lot of old stereograph pictures, and he also is into aerial photography. He gets, gets in a plane every once in a while and goes up and takes some great pictures, which he did recently. So take a look at this artist, and now look at this picture. He's in a slightly different pose. So these were off, off of uh, what they call stereographs, which are uh, were 3D picture cards that you could get back in those days of, uh, of sites. And uh, so it's probably within uh, a very short period these pictures were taken together. Anyway, that's kind of neat. That's one of the things that, uh, one of the recent uh, uh, historic photographs that Bill has shared with us. So let's go back to Taganic Falls. And this is what it looks like on the 15th. I took this picture. It was up the gorge. It's the day after it looked like that. And this was taken by um, a Facebook friend named Sarah Nickerson, and she went up to the Overlook on August 14th, which was the day of the big flood in some of our area, including Taganic Falls. We're lucky we didn't lose the footbridge at the end of the end of the trail, which is not in this picture, but it has been wiped out in some at some times. So, um, but it didn't. The water, the rainfall, the flooding, and so forth was not uniform throughout the area. Some places got a lot of water and got inundated, like Lodi Point on and uh, in Hector area in, uh, on the east shore of Seneca Lake was really swamped and uh, they, they have had a lot of problems there. So let's, let's, but let's take some more pictures here on the day after the flood that uh, Bill took. Now here we're getting into his aerial photography. And so a lot of water coming over the falls. You can see it's still muddy. Now this is a picture of Taganic Point where Taganic Creek comes out of the gorge at the top of the picture and goes into Cayuga Lake. And look at how the mud the muddy water just stops right at the lake. And that's something that Bill pointed out uh, to me. And he said, gee, why is that? And I'm not sure why that is, but I do have a, a hypothesis as to why that is. He said he noticed that in the spring, when muddy water comes gushing out of the streams into the lake, it uh, spreads out over the lake. Well, this is late summer, of course. And what happens during the summer is the lake is, does what's said to be uh, stratified. That is, the top layer of the water, the top 50 or 100 feet or so, warms up and doesn't mix with the cold water below. And actually, the water on the bottom of the lake is just about as cold as it was during the winter. And the colder water is denser, so it sinks. Now, the water coming down the creek from all that rain is probably a lot colder than the water in the, uh, on the surface of the lake that's been absorbing a lot of heat from the sun. So that is, um, that's, um, 
probably that cold water is, this is what I think anyway, is sinking right below that upper layer of warm water, which they call the epilimnion in the cold water below, which is separated by what they call a thermocline, is called the hypolimnion. So, uh, which means low lake, and the epilimnion means surface lake. So, uh, I think that's why the muddy water disappeared when it reached the lake. Okay, well now we're looking uh, higher up on a Google shot, Google Earth shot, down on Teganic Point, which is just uh, the lower right quadrant there. You can see Teganic Point sticking in, actually just right of center. And then you can see a label up there that says Camp Barton. So that's the next gorge to the northwest along the lake shore. And uh, we're going to take a look at uh, how things were at Camp Barton and uh, Frontenac Point, they call it. So there we zoomed in on there. You can see the label of Camp Barton. There's a, there's a small point there into the lake. That's where the Boy Scout camp is, Camp Barton. And just uh, in the sort of hard to make out, but going from the camp down to the road in the lower well, middle center, I guess. That is uh, a gorge. And there's a falls, waterfalls, about right in the center. You see a dark area. That's what, I think that's where the waterfall is, yeah. Frontenac Falls. And so now we're going to zoom around in, in Bill's Plain and look up, and you can see the, um, now the creek actually comes down through those trees in the lower center there. And then in the middle of the picture, you can probably make out water coming over waterfall in the gorge up in there. And that's a pretty nice gorge. Um, but it's not accessible to the general public. It is to the scout troops and so forth. But in any case, uh, that's uh, not a lot of water coming off of there compared to Teganic, and so you don't see this uh, um, muddy water entering the lake, or although we can't get a really good look at the, um, at the stream. Okay, so we're going to look at another spot that also didn't get so muddy during the flood, Buttermilk Falls. This was actually the day of the flood. Um, August 14th and uh, it got full of water and it looked really great as it as it uh, at its best really and uh, living up to its name buttermilk falls but um, when it's really muddy they you might call it chocolate milk falls somebody Paul pointed out but I didn't have a picture of that today this is what it looked like Monday this past Monday so it's less than two weeks later buttermilk falls buttermilk Creek has a small watershed so it responds to the weather so you get a lot of rain, you get some high water for a while, but then it dries up, or, or lessens anyway, um, uh, fairly quickly. So, okay, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna go now over to Watkins Glen area. So here's this map just to orient you if you're not real familiar with the area. If you're looking at this in France or or uh, Nepal or something, there's Ithaca on the right center, and then Watkins Glen State Park at the southern end of uh, Seneca Lake. We're at the southern end of Cuga Lake, of course, in the central area of the Finger Lakes and Watkins Glen State Park. So uh, we're going to look at, not going to look at the park so much, but here's another of Bill's aerial shots that same day uh, following the flood, maybe during the flood, following the flood, yeah. Um, yeah, it would have been the same day, so the 15th. He's looking from the village of Montour Falls up towards Seneca Lake. Now, if you look at the extreme lower left corner, you see a little white streak in the little white spot in the trees. That's actually Chicago Falls in, in the uh, village of Montour Falls. And that was really roaring that day, but I don't have a picture now for that. But the stream, which is in the middle of the, it's actually a canal there, uh, which is Catherine Creek, uh, is full of muddy water. And then the upper right, there is uh, the Queen Catherine Marsh to the right the upper right quadrant is a, is a Department of Environmental Conservation wetland preserved and normally it doesn't look like this but it is flooded and full of mud and then you can see the uh, the canal the, the channelized section of Queen Catherine Creek heading up to the lake very full of mud so Watkins Glen got a lot of mud in fact they were on a boil water um, rule for I don't know a week or so I don't I don't think they're still on it but I'm not sure I did uh, look on the park website, and uh, they no longer had listed that. So let's get some other of uh, Bill's views of Queen Catherine Marsh full of mud that day. So they got a lot more rain than Ithaca did, and uh, they got uh, a lot of consequences, roaring waterfalls, and uh, mud everywhere, muddy water. So now this is a picture of the village. There's some of the same uh, sequence. Uh, you can just see the corner of the lake on the extreme right in the southwest corner. 
and that that arrow points to the gorge, the beginning of the gorge of Watkins Glen State Park, and uh, that still uh, is uh, suffering from flood flood damage. The first half of the gorge is open; the gorge trail is open, and the second half is um, closed because of uh, flood damage and so forth. So I don't know when they'll get that back open. But you can go. You, they say you can see 11 waterfalls. You can go up into the C Glen Cathedral, they call it. And then you have to hike out onto the rim. But still worth a visit, but uh, you won't get to see all the gorge at this time. So, all right. So, yeah, this is just a listing from Watkins Glen State Park saying that. Then a... Uh, one of Bill's shots looking right at the, sh the waterfront where Catherine Creek joins the lake. And maybe that's another situation where the mud is going below the cold, the warm water, the cold, muddy water going below the warm water. Maybe. I don't know. Look at that. This is, there's the uh, creek on the right and then that canal that was made in the center. And uh, shallow water at the shore, but then it kind of disappears. Then looking around, coming around the east, eastern side of the uh, valley, looking southwest and see those streams coming with all that mud. And then the lower left there, you see a gorge. There's a, a ravine. That's uh, one that's not a, on public property, but there is the Finger Lakes Trail goes through there. It's called Excelsior Glen, a very pretty little gorge. So you're walking, you're, you're walking, you're watching Walk in the Park. Uh, my name is Tony Ingram. This is a public access television weekly series in Ithaca, New York on Channel 13. And you can also watch it on my website at walkinthepark.tv. So now we're going to go, let's see what time we got time. Okay, that's, uh, we're going to go to, hmm, we're going to go to a little park, the town of Ithaca Park. Now this is looking right down on Ithaca on Google Earth. At very at the top there is, uh, is uh, Cayuga Lake. And then Tutelo Park is marked there just as down the, the uh, west side of the Cayuga Inlet Valley, just south of the city in the town of Ithaca. And then we're going to zoom in on Tutelo Park. That's uh, the road going up and down on the right there. That is a uh, five mile drive, um, Route 13A. And then the road going from upper right to left is Bostwick Road. And above that, all those yellow things are um, uh, school buses. That's the uh, local school bus garage for the, the um, Ithaca City School District. And right in the center is Tudelo Park. It's a small town park, town of Ithaca Park. And uh, you can see there's a, um, a ball diamond there. And there's also picnic areas and there's a little trail and so forth. Let's get, a, we'll get down on the ground here and take a look at the, uh, so this is a parking lot by the, by the ball diamond, Tudelo Park, called Tudelo Park after Tudelo Indians. And as it says in the 1700s, the Tudelo settled Inlet Valley under the protection of the Cayuga Nation. In 1779, Sullivan Raid drove them into Canada. So that was the um, Sullivan Clinton expedition that came into central New York, Finger Lakes region, and uh, attacked the Iroquois, most of whom, at least the particular ones they attacked, obviously, uh, were allied with the British during the American Revolution. That's a whole story, much of which you can find right here on this interpretive panel. There's actually two sides of it that's in the park. So there's a really great information there. So. I recommend you go over and take a look at Tudelo Park. I, I think it's a really special place. And there's a little path that goes up through the woods and around a little bit of wetland and up in the top of a hill there. And it's a very pretty spot. And they have a picnic shelter, which you can rent. I think it's very reasonable. And, uh, you know, have a function there. So Tudelo Park, really nice spot. Well, I was over at Tudelo Park on uh, the middle of July, probably July 14th or 15th, something like that, during... New York Invasive Species Awareness Week. So um, all across the state, particularly in state parks, but other places too, like the town of Ithaca, and in the town of Ithaca, it was the town of Ithaca Conservation Board, were doing educational activities about invasive species, plants and animals, particularly insects, but mostly plants that uh, we'll be talking about in here, a little bit about insects. But um, so during this particular day in, um, in July, mid-July, there were activities going on in the state parks, and I also went over to Tudelo Park, invited by the Town of Ithaca Conservation Board, of which I used to be a member for a number of years, to um, to see what they were doing, what they were, how they were uh, offering to the public lots of information. So let's take a look at a little video of one of those one of those uh, people that were were at their Town of Ithaca Conservation Board members, who were educating visitors about 
the um, invasive species coming right up. Okay, we're here at Tutelo Park, Town Park for the town of Ithaca, and I'm with Hannah George. Okay, and you just joined the uh, conservation board, and uh, you have you have what what do you have here? So I'm holding a non-native honeysuckle species, mm -hmm. um, and this plant is really common in this area. And some of the problems with it. Uh, that or one of the main problems um, is that it really impacts birds in different ways. So, mm. early season bird or nesting birds will have really high failure rates with their nests when they build them in honeysuckle. Mm. Predators just have a really easy time finding these nests oh. uh, because this plant leaves out earlier, and all the nests are often built in the same level of the forest. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is that these beautiful red berries are actually kind of like candy to birds mm -hmm. and they don't have enough fat and protein for birds to fuel their migration or for birds to uh, you know have enough food for the winter so mm. they eat them a lot because they're bright and uh, tasty because they're really sweet but these are kind of these are mostly sugar and water um, and native berries will have 50 percent fat and protein whereas these have maybe two percent fat and protein. Mm. So it's really a big difference nutritionally, and um, yeah, this plant, when it's around, it takes the space of these native plants that are much better for birds, such as viburnum, um, mm -hmm. elderberry is a great plant. Mm -hmm. There's lots of better alternatives that yeah. we should be planting instead of this. So, so um, how did this plant get here? This is a... Um, there's a bunch of different honeysuckle species from around the world. So there's European and Asian varieties of honeysuckle that were brought over um, for various reasons, ornamentals. Often people plant them in their yard and then it turns out that they escape into the forest. So mm -hmm. um, it's just really people moving these plants and yeah, not so knowing. So it's probably intentional in this case yeah. with this, this plant. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, so how do we how do we uh, manage this, or how do we get rid of it? So this plant, uh, it's pretty easy to pull out of the ground. It's a very weak stem. Um, I've seen videos of people pulling out whole bushes with a grapple hmm. hook that they just tie to the tree or bush and then rip it out. And then I think the important thing is to follow up that removal with the planting of a native shrub mm. or tree that will occupy that space mm -hmm. instead of having this just re-sprout and come back again and again. Yeah. yeah. So that's an important thing for people to have any property to, to know about and to uh, try to control. I know that's, uh, I know some areas that have a lot of this on it. Right, and I like to say that pulling out the invasive is only half the battle. So the next, once you do that, you still have to make sure that spot uh, is restored and that native plants have a chance to, at coming back and you know providing those benefits to wildlife. Okay, thank you very much on the, on the honeysuckle here. You're is there welcome. is there anything else you want to uh, show us? Uh, we could talk about multiflora rose. For multiflora a bit. rose. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. Let's get that one. Bring that one to the same place. All right. So this is multiflora rose, also a non-native invasive species. I see it has some thorns on it. Yeah, yeah, these are the worst thorns that I encounter in the woods. They have made me bleed many times. So I have a personal vendetta against this plant. Um, but again, going back to the impacts of these plants on birds, this plant, um, when birds nest in multiflora rose, they have consistently worse uh, uh, survival rates of their nests. Mm -hmm. So very few of their uh, the, the birds uh, will have a even one chick hatch in a nest when it's uh, built in multiflora rows, and um, it's just consistently bad across the whole season. So that's a problem. This was originally promoted actually as a plant that was good for wildlife because there are these uh, rose hips later in the season but uh, ultimately we're seeing that it's a problem plant it's really good at taking over 
and it just hurts. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna ha it's gonna have some rose hips later, right? The fruit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're pretty small, right? They are, and then the birds will eat them and then spread the seeds, oh, which dude. contributes to the spread. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do we do about this plant? This one again, um, it really. You know, if you cut it back, it'll grow again. So I think the key here is being persistent and uh, understanding that you need to get the roots and um, replace the plant with something native. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that seems to be a, a general principle is to not only remove the plant but put something native in its place, or else maybe you'll have some other invasive of the same uh, occupy this disturbed soil that has an opportunity to jump into. Definitely, and there's a lot of great ways to get a native plant. Um, you can find seed of local uh, plants and collect those seeds, so you're not introducing a different, maybe subspecies of the same plant from a different area. So, for example, if you were to go online and order a plant on eBay, that might not be the right decision. So if you mm. can go to your local woods, find a couple berries, um, that'll be much better. And then there's also several native plant nurseries in the region. There's one here um, in Ithaca, there's one in uh, Geneva, one in mm. Naples. So mm -hmm. if you're in the Finger Lakes region, you can drive to one of these nurseries and pick up a mm -hmm. fully grown bush that you can immediately oh, wow. put to yeah, use. Yeah. So, but you could, if you know your plants, you could, uh, and you have some property, you could take a native plants or seeds or seedling or something like that. You could try that as well, I imagine. Sure, sure. Right? yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the key is that when we are landscaping our properties, you know, in a small house lot or even a larger one, we have a lot of choice. And if we choose a native plant, we're giving that plant an advantage. And um, that's a much better choice than planting a non-native. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're you're putting in some some cornerstones to the ecosystem, when, whereas these occupy some of those important niches that that uh, unsuccessfully for the ecosystem. Right, and another thing um, with non-native plants is that many insects in this area or anywhere are specialists, so they only focus on a certain type of plant. So um, those insect specialists, they're numbers are going to be reduced when fewer of these native plants are available and uh, terrestrial birds basically all raise their young on insects so mm. when there's fewer insects because there's fewer native plants the birds also will suffer um, the you know adult bird will have a harder time finding insects that will make their work less efficient they won't be able to get as much food for their young in the same amount of time mm. uh, so there's just rippling ecosystem effects yeah and these plants have been basically ripped out of their original ecosystem so that none of the associates that they might necessarily have would be with them so it's just weird right right yeah and that's actually a good strategy that scientists are working on using a native predator or a natural enemy of an invasive species to control the plant in its new home um, so that's been going on with the hemlock willia delgid. There's a new biocontrol uh, research facility at Cornell University, and they're looking at two different species. Why one's a beetle? One's, uh, it's a Laracopus and Leucopus. Yeah, also right. Genus names. Laracopus, nigrans, Silverfly, nigrans. yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the little beetle. It's not a beetle? I think it's a... And then there's the fly, the silverfly. Yeah. yeah, Leucopus is the silverfly, and okay. Laracopus doesn't have a common name. Right. Yeah, so there's Flyer. that. They call it Larry. Larry, yeah, little Larry. <laughs> They're very small. You look at it and you're unsure if it's going to actually be able to do anything, and uh, we hope it will. Yeah, I've done some shows on on uh, hemlock woolly adelgid before, and they were talking about the Larry the Larry bug, but but uh, the silver fly is is new to me. So yeah. right, yeah, and uh, there's also another biocontrol uh, that's being researched at the moment for pale swallowwort. Uh, that one is also um, here at Cornell. There's a lab doing research on a moth called Hypena okay. opulenta and that's from Ukraine which is where pale swallowwort is from and uh, the problem with pale swallowwort it's really taking over a lot of different habitats from uh, abandoned fields to forests which is very uncommon that's it's similar to garlic mustard in that respect yeah. and um, it actually confuses monarch butterflies because it's in the same I believe it's the same family maybe even genus it's yeah, the same, same family yeah 
yeah, yeah. And so monarchs will accidentally lay their eggs on pale swallowwort, and then none of those eggs will survive because they are a specialist uh, species where they have to have monarch. Um, the monarchs have to have milkweed, and they're built. They have a resistance to the milkweed toxins, but they don't have resistance to pale swallowwort toxins. So that's oh. um, potentially one contributor to the decline of monarch butterflies. Right. There's a lot of other contributors, yeah. but that's not certainly not helping when there's fewer uh, milkweeds and more pale swallowworts in the area. Yeah, and all these attempts to to uh, reproduce that fail because of the uh, mm -hmm. of the confusion that this plant causes. And I, I I know some places where there is the pale swallowwort, and there's nothing else on the ground. Mm -hmm. Right, they're really good at um, taking over and being a monoculture. And in some places, I. Uh, in Rhode Island, uh, these monarch butterflies, they get confused and lay their eggs in the wrong place about 20% of the time. So that, um, that certainly has an impact on their populations. In New York, they believe it's a different population, so maybe different rates or maybe less of an issue, but certainly, um, you know, this is a plant to watch out for, and it's really uh, become more common in the past maybe 20 years. Yeah. yeah. Even though it has been in this country since the 1800s. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how it's, I guess, an exponential curve. Do we have a sample of that? We do uh, not have swallowwort okay. here. Yeah, it's more common um, like along the lake. Yeah. Um, we actually had some. Uh, we were, I was at Robert Treeman State Park. Oh, yeah. They had, that, they yeah. They had some samples up they there. They do, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to drop a uh, still image of some of these plants anyway. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, yeah, that's all I have to say about. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully that's all. Yeah. Did, are you? Um, you live in the area for a while? Yeah. Or? So I grew up in Ithaca. Oh. I. Yeah, I went from K through 12 here in Ithaca. Then I went to Cornell oh, did you? to study yeah. natural resources. Oh, good, good. And now I work for the Finger Lakes Land Trust. Oh, you do? You yeah. work for the Land Trust? Yeah, for you. yeah. Oh, so I just joined in August. Uh -huh, yeah. So it's about one year yeah. with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so what do you do? For, what do you do? Okay, well, that's about all the time we have for the uh, show. There's a little bit more talking there, but uh, we'll be following up this uh, discussions of. Um, uh, invasive species, particularly plants, in future episodes, particularly the pale swallowwort. There's a there was a I got a lot of information about it at Taganic Falls and a team that's been working on it up there, as a, particularly as a study area. So um, um, that's all we have for today. So I encourage you to turn off this screen and go outside and go for a walk in the park or some other similar place and enjoy our world. So I'm going to put up this last picture of Taganic Falls taken by Bill Heck as we do our credits coming right up here. Thanks for joining me. Um, 